My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is Tuesday, April 16th, 2013, and I'm in Stillwater, Oklahoma, interviewing Stephen McElroy and Patricia McElroy as part of the O State Stories Oral History Project. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today. Well, let's begin. Um, first, uh, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about your family connection to OSU. Patricia, could you start off and, and tell us uh, where you were born and the year you were born, and tell me a little bit about your parents. Okay. Um, I was born in 1950, August 11th, uh, in Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, my parents, uh, at the time, ran a, they managed an apartment complex. And my recollection is it was at that time right across the street from the OU golf uh, course. So, because the only reason why I know that is because we had golf balls that ended up in the front yards <laughs> all the time. Uh, my, I don't think my mother worked at the time other than managing out of that, that office, uh, nor my father. I think he just did maintenance to take care of the buildings. How they got there, I don't know. Um, we moved as a family back here to Stillwater when I was three or four, so that would have been 1953, 54, uh, and moved into a house about a quarter of a mile from C.H. McElroy's house. And uh, so I could walk if I, as I got older, could walk to their house um, and often did ride my bike there. So uh, when we moved, my mother got a job at the university. Um, do you want me going to go into that? Her first job uh, was in animal husbandry in that beautiful building. She worked for and I can't tell you the professor, but she, he was the, in charge of Herefords, so it was cows. So she got really good at knowing about cows. Um, then she transferred to the dairy department and was still with cows, but they were doing different things. <laughs> and then finally, uh, she ended up at the athletic department, which is where she retired from first as the uh, secretary for the uh, football coach and the assistant athletic director. And then uh, she retired as uh, administrative assistant to the athletic director for OSU. My father, uh, when they moved here, I assume has had this job, same job all, all of his life here in Stillwater. He was the uh, supervisor for grant maintenance and grounds, building and grounds, excuse me. Uh, for OSU athletic department. He stayed in that job until he retired. Mm. So. Wow. All right, Stephen, uh, if you could tell us the year you were born and a, a little bit about your parents. Well, I was born in 1957 in Los Angeles, California. Uh, my father, Buell McElroy Jr., was the son of McElroy Senior. Buell McElroy Senior, my granddaddy Mac, we always called him. And um, as a child, as a young child, we'd come back to Stillwater to visit. This was by that time they were living out McElroy Road out well, no, there. We, so. Well, we were out on Sixth Street, were we not? Right. Yeah, which is the residence I referred to, that's like a quarter of a mile from. And uh, some of my earliest childhood memories were with my granddaddy, Mac, coming down to the campus at night. For some reason, he had to come down on business. And like I was telling Pam, he had this keychain that seemed like it had a thousand keys on it. And it would be dark in the buildings. You'd have a little flashlight, and 
he'd, he'd show me how he had these different rings um, in between the sets of keys, and that's how he could tell at night which key set he was using to get in the different doors. Um, just had really fascinating and wonderful memories of my granddaddy Mac. So go back to your father. Um, my father, um, I guess he was very close with Dean Mac. Um, apparently he spent some time being raised by his grandmother and grandfather. And um, I remember visiting as a child CH's house, and we always called him CH. And, um, and he was just a very tall, very formidable man to me, very, very quiet spoken. And as a five year old kid, that's mostly what I remember about him. Um, I do remember. Uh, when he passed in, we decided it was 1970, that he, uh, my father was very, very affected by that. He wasn't talking about it. He didn't talk much about his feelings. But I remember he flew back for the funeral, and uh, it was a very somber time in our family's life. So. Your mother? My mother? Mother uh, and my father met while they were going to school here, as I understand. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they moved to California about two years before I was born. My older brother is, is two years older than me, and they, he was born in Oklahoma, so, um, yeah. Love my mom. <laughs> She's uh, she did a real good job raising our raising us kids for many years, and um, in her later years, lived out her dream, moved to Napa, into the house that I'm living now on Main Street, and uh, became the artist. Just did artwork for the rest of her life, and that was always her dream. So, good for you, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're sitting here today in, in McElroy Hall here at the OSU Veterinary Medicine School. And let's talk a little bit about uh, what you remember or what you can recall about Dean McElroy. Well, I, I spent a lot of, you know, I guess they, they babysat me often. And because, uh, you know, I, I grew up with parents that both worked, uh, which back in that time I think was rare uh, when I, you know, I look back on it and, and look at my friends, uh, most of them, their mothers did not work. My father, my father had a, a much uh, more relaxed job, I guess you'd say. So he seemed like he could get off at any time. So he would get off and pick me up from work. Um, and so during the week, most of the time, I would spend at home. But on the weekends, sometimes I'd go to my, my grandparents. And Granddaddy had a fairly large piece of property on 6th Street. I couldn't tell you how many acres, but it was acreage. And he had a farm. Uh, he had pigs. He had chickens. Um, he had... Well, eventually I got a couple of horses, and so those horses uh, stayed there at some time. One of my fondest memories was uh, when the pig was pregnant, and I'd hear, I would get a phone call. I'd say, okay, come, you know, it's time. And so, you know, begrudgingly, my father would drive me down, and so I would watch as the piglets were born. And, of course, I loved all of that, and it was great fun. And, and of course, my grandfather, in the process, I'm sure taught me a lot about that process and, and how it worked and what happens. And, and of course, you know, the tragedy with, as you're growing up, you learn kind of the, the, the I guess, lessons of life. Because when a sow, as big as they are, uh, when they want to lay down, they can't stop themselves. 
So there were many piglets that ended up under the mom. Mm. And so that was part of, you know, what I learned. Uh, and, and, you know, as much as that was, oh, no, that's so sad, you know, I remember my grandfather explaining, you know, that's just what happens. Of course, they have lots of piglets, so uh, I don't know if that's part of nature's way of making sure that they maintain the herd by having so many. Um, I also remembered uh, he would go out and feed the chickens, and, uh, uh, and of course, I never was great on putting my hand in, in a nest with a chicken laying to get eggs. We always had fresh eggs. That was one thing. I did help him, uh, especially in the summer, uh, clean the eggs, kind of, how I did this I don't remember, kind of figure out whether it was a large egg or whether it was a medium egg and all that great A, mm -hmm. double A kind of thing. Okay. And we had to do that. And then we would take the egg as in cartons to a store that I think it was on Knobloch, but I'm not sure. Not there anymore. And he would sell his eggs there. Um, so people would buy Dean Max fresh chicken eggs. The interesting thing, I remember one time when I was little, I had, you know, I think when kids are little, they wear tennis shoes of different colors. I think we've gotten more sophisticated now and it's going to be wider. Or they have little sparklies on them. Well, I had red tennis shoes on one day. And I got, I must have been five or six. And it was a sunny day, I remember that. My grandfather was out spraying feed out for the chickens to come out into the yard to eat. Well, the chickens, instead of going toward the feed, just started coming toward me. And they were doing it aggressively, but they were definitely deliberately coming. And I was just standing there and watching my grandfather in the distance. And then he said, get out of the yard. <laughs> um, okay. And so there was a gate right behind me. It was right by the uh, garage. And so I got out of the yard. Well, <laughs> he informed me, as the vet he was, that the chickens, who are basically colorblind, have learned that red for them is blood and so they were coming after fresh meat. <laughs> they didn't care about the feed that went down there. This was more enticing. So man, I took a hike. So it was one of my lessons was don't wear red around chickens. So never did. Cute. Again. Uh, so I did wear red when I was younger. Uh, <laughs> as I got older I learned not to. <laughs> but I do remember that. It was like, oh, okay. The other thing, he had a pond on that property and they every once in a while they'd stock it and he and I would go fishing and he kept cane poles in the garage and the garage had open beams and so we would they would stick the cane pole because they were long very mm -hmm. long and he would keep them up there and so I'd come over and we'd go down to the pond and fish <laughs> he had his cane pole I had my cane pole and we would fish um, also we had a he had a large garden and he loved to plant corn and green beans. Grandmother used to sit there and pop the and peas, pop them out. I can see her on the back stoop uh, with a bowl, pop those in there. And in the whole family, uh, my father had a sister, uh, and uh, she had two sons who was, are still living. And uh, when she got married, she became a Blankenship. So uh, her first name was Geraldine. So all the women, so my grandmother uh, and my mother and my aunt, the women folk, would be in the kitchen. And then my grandfather and I would be out in the garden pulling the ears of corn. We would take it to my father, who was sitting on the edge of his truck on the front yard, and he would peel off the silks and take the worms out, because that was the other thing that you had in, in corn. And then they would go inside and they'd get blanched. So it was a whole thing that we did every season. And then after everything was done, they would divvy it up and put them in plastic bags and the whole family would take the corn <laughs> to various houses. But I remember doing that faithfully every season with my grandfather, getting that corn. Um, 
the other neat thing, he had a strawberry patch that was on, on a path of a sidewalk that led from the back door to the garage. And, and it was, the way it was planted, it was in a round thing, and then right in the middle it was empty. <laughs> As a little child, I would get the hose, I'd sit in the middle, and I would wash off the uh, strawberries and eat them. Sit right there. <laughs> so I, they, I guess it was my strawberry patch. So that was, the strawberries would get water. Yeah, very uh, memorable. At least I knew to wash them. But that was, those were some really cool things that I used to do. Uh, Granddaddy also was pretty up with the politics of the city. Mm -hmm. I don't think he ever. He may have run for something, but I don't really remember. But he would meet a bunch of guys that were also, you know, people, pillars of the city. At one of the, there's a local cafe down on um, Main Street. And uh, I'm not real sure what I did. I, I just, that's not a recollection I remember. Uh, but we, he would go to coffee, morning coffee. And that was a very common thing. He would do it during the week too, but if I was in school, obviously I wouldn't with him. But on the weekends, Saturdays, I remember getting in the big black car, which was a Ford. They both had matching Ford cars. And uh, getting in that car, and we would go down to that cafe, and I would sit there, and they would talk. I have no idea what they're talking about. And I would have my little coffee or milk or whatever. But I did that a lot with him. That was a very common exercise for the two of us to do. <laughs> would you have chores when you would visit? No, I was, you know, it's still the same about going to, going to grandparents, you know. No. Eating strawberries. <laughs> no. I mean, I, I remember I would get a Coke, the, you know, they had the little, the short little Cokes. I would, I would be allowed to go to the, go to the refrigerator and get a Coke. Uh, but I do remember the big thing was doing the, uh, I mean, I guess the chores in a way were the, were doing the eggs and that kind of stuff. And that was pretty ongoing. Mm -hmm. Um. I would help feed the pigs, and but Granddaddy was was right there. I I really don't re ever remember doing it on my own. Uh, I do remember it was neat because he had a barn, and he had a feed room, and and it was a pretty sturdy door that had that feed in it. He'd open that door, and you could smell, and I know smells are a real important thing for memories. He would and he'd have these bins, and the bins had different feed in it for the different animals, and he that would hit you. It was a wonderful smell. And, and I would go down to the mill, uh, which obviously is still present, and, and help him get feed sometimes. Uh, and my grandmother, and that was back, I don't know what the feed comes in now, but they came in uh, cotton, you know, uh, bags. My grandmother would take those and make pillowcases and stuff, and I still have some of that. Hmm. And she would embroider, make them fancier. Uh, and she she would do that often, and so we've got dish towels and and some well, mostly dish towels that were made out of those old feed sacks because they were good uh, good material. Uh, but I, I do remember going down to the feed store or feed the, to the to the mill and getting feed. Yeah. So, so there were different things, you know, just depended on what what time of year it was and what he needed, and we would go. So I did do a lot of that, and I did go on vacation with him a couple of times, just he and I, uh, when I was older, and we took a train to go? Kansas City, I think. First time I ever was on a train, that was cool. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so those are the recollections. He, I didn't, he didn't take me too much to school, mm -hmm. you know, with him, to the university. Now, he did my father. <laughs> there are stories about him taking my father, and I think my father spent a lot more time, obviously, uh, I wasn't around, uh, and had his work. And I know my father saw some pretty gross, gruesome things that were just part of the learning process at the vet school. Uh, I think they used to do experiments on chickens, so my father would not eat chicken. He wouldn't eat turkey either. I think that was just a transfer. I don't think they were working on turkeys. My mother, it took a long time for my mother to finally convince my father that it really is okay, you can eat this. 
So she used to sneak it in, wow. a, in a dish, and he wouldn't know what it was. He wouldn't eat it. He would not eat chicken or turkey. So when he'd go to these banquets and stuff, which he didn't do often, but you know, inevitably, they would have chicken <laughs> on the menu. We didn't have the selections we have now, so he wouldn't eat it. <laughs> so, but yeah. Any more um, remembrances of your grandmother? What did she do? Did she have an occupation? Well, um, you know, that's interesting. The book of uh, this... The, the There's history. a picture of her in the book yeah. right here. This one? Yep. Maggie. Um, she, it kind of reminded me of um, what a military wife, you know, if the military guy was the head of the unit for the military, the wives would get together. Well, that's what they did. So I think that's what my grandmother did. Because he, you know, first he was the dean of, of the vet school, and then he became dean of men. Mm -hmm. And so he got more involved at a higher level with more uh, uh, involvement with the university. And so I think her role greatly was deal with the wives of whomever. Mm -hmm. And I think she did a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I only saw her at home. Um, we never really did much together other than at home. So uh, I was just a little kid who was running around the house. How old were you when he passed away? I was a sophomore in college. Hmm. It was midterms. I remember that. He'd been sick in the hospital for a little while and uh, my sophomore year was not a wonderful year. And, you know, you're taking all of those courses that you have to take that you really don't care about, but you have to take them. But they're not my major, you know. I finally got into my major, which was a much better world for me. But, and so you're taking all those courses like, you know, the big classes of history where everybody doesn't know your name and that kind of stuff. And uh, when he died, um, well, they, they closed the university for the day. Uh, which I was just floored about. I mean, they, no classes were held that day, and uh, which was a pretty impressive thing from my standpoint. And my friends kept saying, "You need to call your professors and see if you can get extensions on your on your tests." And I took some of them, but I did finally call a couple of them, and they said, "Well, I've been waiting for you to call," <laughs> which I thought was very nice of them. I said, well, "Could I have in a couple of days before?" You know, well, certainly. You know, so it, it wasn't like, I certainly wasn't lying about why I needed the extension. It was all over the place. Uh, I'm the, um, the Daily Oklahoman had a big spiel and it was on the news. It was a pretty big deal. And, and I guess you realize that when this happens, how much of a big deal he was. And it was like, whoa. So, um, so yeah, I was here. And, uh, it was a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. say the least. Well, Stephen, let, let's talk about some of your, your memories as a little boy. Sure. Um, well, it's, it's funny to hear her talk about her grandfather taking her out to collect the eggs and, and feed the chickens, check on the horses, because you did the same thing with us. Okay. On the old ranch. Okay. So, must have sunk in it because must have. Uh, that's and one I was of the a things little bit I older, remember. So yeah, she was kind of a big sister. She would take us fishing. Yeah, because there was a pond. So, all these things you're talking about, it's like you did the same thing with us kids when we came to visit. So, those are really great memories for me. And, um, gosh, there's so much. Um, and you know what sparked this uh, getting you was when we were, walked in, I showed him a picture of, yes. of Max. And Max is... Max McElroy let's is... Let's see the relationship. He's a cousin. He's C.H.'s brother's son. son. Right. So Granddaddy had a brother whose name was Emmett who stayed in Creek County, which is where they kind of landed. Mm -hmm. 
And when you looked at the two of them, he looked very Indian. Indian, black hair, high cheekbones. Mm -hmm. Granddaddy got the Irish Scotch with the red hair and the freckles, but they were definitely brothers. And he ran an old, tiny um, trading post over in Creek County. You're talking about Emmett. Emmett, great place to go when you're a kid. So he had a son, Max, who ended up going to school here and became a vet. And he graduated in 1956. So that's what started this conversation because he started talking. And about that's it. that's where I'd like to to interject that. Um, we always called him Cousin Mac, uh, Max, but he was actually my father's cousin, right? Yeah, we would make you a second cousin. Right. But he had a veterinary practice right up on Ventura Boulevard in Thousand Oaks, I think it was, in North Hollywood there. And we loved to visit Cousin Max. He always had a story to tell. He was quite a character. He was a wonderful man. Um, and um, just when she showed me his photograph here, graduating class 56, you said it was? Well, I was just floored because he's so young looking. But um, he had his own set of really very interesting stories. Being in that area just below the Hollywood Hills, he was the veterinary for all the stars. Um, I remember one of the last get-togethers our family had, he invited all his McElroys over to his house to, I think it was for Thanksgiving one year. And um, I not us. We were still we were here. Yeah. So it was all she the was still out in California. Here, but the California McElroys went out and had Thanksgiving and Max had so many stories about the the Hollywood stars and whatnot. And one of the things I thought was interesting was his story about Marilyn Monroe, who apparently he had an appointment with her to have lunch, I think. The very day she turned up dead, so seem to think that was pretty fishy. Anyways, um, back to um, McElroy's. You know, I discovered most of my information sort of after the fact when I started getting into genealogy as an adult. I, I started getting curious about the McElroy name and tried to trace it back. And this is when I discovered all the, the, the lineage of, of C.H. being part Indian. Which I already knew. She already knew all this. I had no idea. And as a child, I can only remember from about the age of five on, I just had this love of the country, this love of the land, and um, joined the Boy Scouts because they would always go camping and be close to nature. And, um, and then when I discovered this Indian connection, to me it, it, it made sense because I felt like that's the part of my family that drove me to be like that. You know? <laughs> it's, it's in the blood. So um, he was... Yeah, I've always had a very close um, love of nature and, and animals, and I, I think I got that through through him. So I attribute a lot of my um, love of nature and animals to C.H. because I truly believe that's that's where I got all that. Would you come back to Stillwater often? Yes, we would. Um, I think I think it sort of tapered off once CH passed on. Yeah. Um, and honestly, I graduated high school in '75, so I was off on my own, finding my own way. Um, I, like I said, I knew from an early age that I didn't want to be in the city. I 
I would use every excuse I could to get out of there. In fact, I would, I would spend summers with my neighbors across the street, had grandparents up in the Central Valley over in San Joaquin. They had a big orange orchard. Well, that was the country. So they would invite me to come up with them. And I don't know how my parents felt about that, but they let me do it. Um, now, I, and I, only, I really only recall one time that they came vividly. I mean, I'm, I know mm -hmm. that they came more often, but I, I remember his parents going to Oklahoma City to see something. And so my parents babysat all the boys, because the girls, because he has a younger sister. She wasn't here yet. And um, we had a tornado that came through. Mm -hmm. And we had to evacuate to a, a mm -hmm. shelter. And so I remember I have a picture of Bryce asleep we were just kind of wide-eyed, like, what's going on? And we ran two doors down from the house to a storm shelter <laughs> and stayed down in there for about oh, what a night for, for the parents to be gone and mm -hmm. the, the grandparents having to take care of all the kids. So we would call that episode of happening. <laughs> My grandmother also lived out here, and she ran that hotel. Right. Um, Not the same grandma. This This from a different part of the family, um, my mom's side. And so we would come spend summers here in, yeah. I think that was over in Norman. Was yeah, there the, were several hotels. There was a hotel that she ran. Yeah, one of the interesting things with his, his mother, Yvonne, who, my sister-in-law. Of course, when I was little, not knowing the terminology, I used to tell the sisters, the teachers, that my brother married my sister. And needless <laughs> to say, I got a lot of attention. <laughs> but I didn't quite understand. You know, I since learned, but I, I caught on. I said, well, I don't understand. You know, well, that's not possible. But I really, uh, really, I loved my sister-in-law. And uh, she found out when she started going to school, I'm sure you know this, she wanted to go into art. Uh, mm -hmm because she was a very good artist. And her father wouldn't let her. So she ended up in textile. Uh, fashion design. Yeah, I think. fashion design. Which she had a very good eye for. Mm -hmm. And had, later years, had... had uh, boutiques? She, boutiques. She opened she her own sold, boutiques. You know, mm -hmm. And so she, she was very good at that. But she always went back to her uh, art. It was a big deal. But she, mm -hmm. he was not going to support her tuition if she went into the art stuff. Wow. So she, she always wanted kind of had to compromise. To go to New York and yeah. drink coffee and smoke cigarettes and things like that. Yeah. But uh, that side of my family got us back to Oklahoma lots of times. As kids we were always wanting to go to Frontier City and do the, do the fun things, swim in the pool, um, uh, let's see, uh, I remember being out here one trip, and this was sort of a traumatic experience <coughs> because my sister, I know she was four, she had her fourth birthday here in Norman, I believe it was, <clears throat> and she came down, I don't know, with diabetes. That's when she got real sick. That's when she got sick. Yeah. And uh, I remember my mother and my sister flying back to Los Angeles to get her in the hospital, and my dad piling my brother and me in his old Corvair. <laughs> and we beelined it back for California. We didn't even stop at the house first. We went straight to that hospital. But I remember along the way, and this is what I was going to get tell you earlier, we had a blowout. And it was fun, for, it was scary as heck yeah. for my dad, and I always remember looking at the tire and thinking, oh, it's shredded wheat. 
So I was Shredded. telling you earlier, I was looking at my tire and noticing it was bald on my motorcycle, and I just, you know, that's where my brain keeps going back to <laughs> as a child. <laughs> that blowout, so I'm going to have my tire changed before I leave for California. That's good, because we do not want any shredded wheat no, on the road. No, more shredded wheat, especially <laughs> with a motorcycle. That's, yeah. Well, when you, when you think about your family... Uh, talk to me about how you, you hope your, your family legacy is viewed here at Oklahoma State. Well, you know, I will tell you the interesting thing uh, was that um, I, moved, I moved away from here after I graduated, uh, went down to Louisiana and, and really never, I mean I came back but because my parents were still here, but never really otherwise. and. I remember getting, I made a donation to, to the vet school, one of the things, you know, when the, the OSU callers call, mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, they always want me to give it to this, and I said, no, I, wanted to give, I want to give it to the vet school. And so I always do that, and they always have to make sure, you know, change everything they've got in front of them. And so I made a donation, it was not that big, but I got a letter from, from the dean's office which I'm sure everybody got a letter from the dean's office. It wasn't anything big. But I, I looked at it and I went, oh, okay. And then I looked at the return address and it said McElroy Hall. And I went, huh, okay. So I called the number on the letter because it was a you know, letterhead stationery. So I called and got the secretary for the dean and it was uh, uh, Dean uh, Landis at the time. Is it there? I'm not sure that's his name. Uh, Lorenz. Lorenz, thank you. I knew that was I was getting the wrong letter. And uh, of course, I'm not mad at him or anything. But I talked to the secretary, and I said she didn't know who I was. And I said, "Is this the dean's office?" She said, "Yes." And I said, "Could you tell me where your office is located?" <laughs> and he said, "She said, well, it's in the McElroy Hall building." And I said, "Could you tell me when that became the McElroy <laughs> Hall building?" <laughs> I didn't have a clue. And she says, oh, about three years ago. And I went, oh, okay. And then I told her I was. Mm -hmm. And she went, oh. And see, my aunt, my father's sister, lived here and, and died here. But she had Blankenship as her last name. So if you, they didn't know, I'm sure they just kind of lost that process. And so they didn't know where any of the family was, so I guess they never reached out to try to get any. So. We, I was oblivious to the fact that this building got renamed. So I went, oh, okay. Well, one thing led to another. And so I think we got a hold of the development people from that conversation. And then, then the thing with the award. I said, are you people still giving that award out? And oh, yeah. And I said, oh, okay. And so I said, well, why don't I come sometime? And I, I'll go to the banquet. And so that's what started that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I've been doing it maybe the last six years or so. Sometimes I've missed because work just wasn't uh, conducive for me to get off for four days to come up here. Um, so that was a pleasant surprise. I will tell you the other thing, when I was younger, I got on this kick because McElroy Road has been McElroy Road since before I was born. And I noticed as I got older and a little more savvy to politics that streets run one way in this city and drives run another way. And then you have McElroy Road. Hmm. And so I started doing some investigating and find out why is it called road? Why isn't it called a drive like every other street or mm -hmm. whatever? And I ended up at the fire station, the head fire station with their maps and everything. Oh, well, can you see it's an extension here? And that does fine, but it's not named right, you know. I could never figure it, go to whoever needed to rename it because I thought it needed to be renamed. It still doesn't make sense to me. Uh, but so that was one thing, you know, I tried to do as a, as a little citizen of the town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that didn't happen. And then as I was growing up, um, of course, my friends knew, uh, you know, uh, my grandfather, mainly because their parents knew. Um, he was big at the YMCA, he was on the board, and so when I was probably still in junior high, I got a job there, I'm sure he got it for me, and I kind of was a lifeguard, sort of, but I 
took the baskets and for the people to put their stuff in. And so I spent my a couple of summers at the Y. Loved it. I was a little water baby in it. And uh, my grandmother, I remember, started to get sick, um, like the second, the end of the first summer. And I don't really know. My f mother always thought that she had diabetes, but she never, that never came out. But she would like wander, and we'd have to find her. And she didn't wander far, but you know, it was like she just didn't know where she was. Um, and I do remember that there was a, in fact, I think I have it, um, there's a, there was a uh, portrait of my grandfather that was at the Y, and I went there to see it or something, and they didn't have it up anymore, and they didn't want to have it up. I said, oh, okay. So they gave it to me. Hmm. So I said, okay, I'll take that. So I started going around making sure that if there were portraits up, they were still up, or nope, you know. Hmm. So that was the only one that I found, but that, and I do have it at the house. Uh, it's not in great condition. It needs to be reframed. Um, so, I, you know, I did that. But a lot of times for me, when people met me, it was like, oh, you're Dean McElroy's grand, grandchild. And so I got that a lot as I was growing up. I kind of, you know, felt bad for my father because I never was his daughter. I was more my grandfather's grandchild. So, you know, as you grow up, you kind of, you know. So one of the reasons why I kind of left home for a little while, I went to, went to school down in Dallas, was to get away from that. And I don't know if that's, I, I would think that sometimes it's common. I just didn't want to be anybody's grand anything. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be me. And it wasn't a bad thing to be who I was, but it was just I kind of wanted to try for my own identity kind mm -hmm. of thing. And, uh, and so, you know, over time. But it, it's nice now to come back. Although, you know, a lot of those people aren't around anymore, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which is why we do this kind of thing. Right. Uh, so, uh. Anything to add, Stephen? Well, yes, I, I have a lot to add to. Your question was mm -hmm. how we would like our family's legacy to right. be remembered. And as I've stated, I, I, I didn't know much about my family until and I was an adult and started getting into genealogy, but um, I always knew things that struck me, like uh, I was I was gardener in a ranch for many years in the Napa Valley and spent a lot of time up in the hills. And uh, there happened to be a, a Native American settlement out there. I'd go comb the vineyards, there were vineyards at the time, and I'd find things like this. And I, I always remember it just being like gold to me, you know, just, and um, being out hiking and finding a big beautiful hawk feather or something, those things were, were just magic to me. And like I said, I didn't find out until later that my granddaddy was part Indian, and it's it's no secret that the Indians were very close to the earth and nature and wildlife, giving thanks for their their meals to the animals that they've killed and whatnot. And so, um, I believe that C. H.'s love. And, and that sort of blood through his veins attracted him towards this veterinary sort of way of life. The love of animals, the love of uh, caring for animals, um, that type of thing. It seems to me that it plays into that whole Native American blood connection. And so, I would like his, the McElroy family legacy to be sort of the connection to the earth and, and the animals on a sort of a Native American level, which... Yeah, and I, I, I kind of, I can reflect that too in that um, I really wanted to uh, get that not recognition, but the the paperwork 
of, of the Native American. I had a letter that indicated that, that my grandfather had written that had his tribal number on it, which is very helpful when mm -hmm. you have it. And so, uh, you know, I connected with Steve later and, and uh, indicated that I had that information and had the form, which I finally found, that I used to get my uh, uh, card from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and then connected with the Creeks, which is the tribe for the family. And so I, I have that and I tease people that I'm a card-carrying Native American. There aren't a lot of them anymore, uh, and first generation removed from people on the rolls, because grandfather was on the, on the rolls. And, and you can see it when you go into the Dawes. Uh, you can go right online and find see his signature. Uh, so that, that kind of thing today is so rare. And I think the other thing, it's even rarer in Louisiana. I mean, they've got a couple of drives, but it's like, you're pretty much not there. And, and so, you know, knowing and growing up, knowing about the civilized tribes, and of course that was part of Oklahoma history, and you had to take those, that course uh, in junior high. So from that standpoint, I think it, it's, it's important from my point of view, and, and uh, it never really was something that Granddaddy talked about, although obviously he, he had that connection and he knew it. And, uh, and then you, you knew it when you went and saw his brother, as I said, um, and, the, and the trading post, and I'm sure he had stories. Max probably would have had great stories from that standpoint. I would be, Max was much older from me, and so I didn't really get, I wasn't privy to that information. Um, I did and have taken up the uh, Indian flute as, a, as part of my uh, Indian heritage, so I have done that, and I'm now proud owner of two of those. They are not cheap, and I had one which was fairly large, and there was a, a LSU has a leisure class process, and you can take courses that last like six weeks, 12 weeks, something like that. And I had one for Native American flutes. So I went, oh, good. So I enrolled. Well, one other person enrolled. Well, there wasn't enough to make the class. So I got a hold of the people who were having the class, and I said, could you let me know who the person is? Because I had recently retired, so I had some time, and so I thought, oh, well, maybe I could take some private lessons. Well, it turned out the lady who was teaching the class lived four blocks away from me in my neighborhood. This just was meant to be. Neat. So, I mean, she owned 30 of them. When I walked in, she had all these flutes. I said, okay, and I have my measly little one. She said, well, I think you need to get one that's smaller for your hands. So she recommended that I get another one. So I did. Well, the guy who makes them, the one I got, lives in Dallas. And so I got, well, I just got an email from them because they were going to be at some festival in Florida. So I wrote it back and I said, I appreciate the fact that you've kept me, you keep me informed with going to this, but I said, you know, I own two flutes and that's probably one more than I ever thought I would own. And so she wrote back and she says, well, they're kind of like chocolate once you taste them. You want more? And I said, well, let's hope it doesn't turn into chocolate. Because they, as I said, they're very expensive. And so it was like, okay, I'm not sure I'm going too far with this. But, and the other thing I did do uh, with the Native American, I did as a treat for me, it was on my bucket list. I was in Washington, D.C. at the opening of the Native American Museum. And uh, a friend of mine and I went up there. And the neat, first of all, the number of Indians was just incredible. And all in native garb, although I was in jeans, you know. And, but it was just so fascinating. And to be there on the grounds with all of these Native Americans just everywhere that day, it was just really impressive. And I have since gone back to the museum several times and am a, a charter member of, the, of that board. But, so I, I really did try to get into those roots mm -hmm. and have continued to do that uh, as much as I can. And when I, I have a cypress tree in my backyard and one of the things I just did, uh, there was a guy I was having clear some land and he had a saw. And I said, would you cut off one of these? He, want, he thought I wanted him to cut off all the cypress. And, oh, no, no, just one. And I picked this one because I'm going to make a handle out of it. I own 
and you have to have a you have to be a card carrying Indian to do this. I own an eagle eagle feather, mm -hmm. which another Indian gave to me, and uh, and he found out through another person that I wanted one, and, and he gave it to me mm -hmm. right before he died, actually. And so I have those, and then I had to find some other feathers to kind of expand this thing I want to make. And so if I was told turkey feathers are the best thing to use. So then I had to send out an uh, email, who's going turkey hunting anytime soon? I need some turkey feathers. So I got turkey feathers. So I have all the fixings for this. I just have to put it together. But, but that's one thing I want to do, and I have a shadow box that I'm going to put it in. Uh, so that uh, I can put it on display. So I think also, you know, touching on what Steve says about about the Native American, that's really important to me, and uh, I appreciate going to the uh, 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 to the to the museum, and and so that legacy is is really uh, important. And I've had some conversations with people at the museum about our relationship to the to the Creek Nation. Uh, I think. Uh, and we talked about this yesterday, uh, Pleasant Porter, who was a chief, he was the last known chief of the tribe prior to treaties, which was in 1907. And based on what he told me yesterday, and my mother said, and I have a, I have a picture of him in full dress, we're cousins. Hmm. So there's definitely a strong you know, relationship from that uh, tribal sense in the McElroy's. Uh, so, uh, I think that's the other legacy that's real important. That's um, good that you you still feel that connection. Yeah, yeah. Um, now y'all are here tonight for for something special. Yeah. Could you could you tell us a little bit about the award? Well, um, it's been given. This is the 60th year that the uh, Dean McElroy Award has been given uh, to the outstanding graduating senior class member. Uh, for, I don't know, the, I guess, I don't know what the guidelines are on what, how they do it, but I think the class, it, it may be a combination of the class and the teachers decide on who gets it. It's a big deal, it's a surprise to the person, uh, and um, I, last year, when I was here, kind of got this crazy idea of, so uh, I, asked, I emailed back here and said, when was this thing first started? So they told me, so I did a little math. I said, you know, the 60th anniversary of this thing's coming up. What if you try to invite as many uh, back as you can? Well, they brought it to some committee and thought that was a great idea. So that's why there's like 13 of them coming wow. tonight uh, for, uh, for the awards. And this particular awards banquet, which is, you know, as I said, a year, an annual thing, has like, they give out 250 awards at the evening. And they do it very well, because they do it every year. So it moves, even though you look at this horrendous yeah. list. Scholarship. It's amazing how fast yeah. they do, you know, get it done. Uh, but they give, you know, some of them are huge amounts. They, these people get $20,000. Some they get 500. Some they know about because they've had to fill out, they've had to do apply for uh, re, uh, not resumes, um, like a story. What would you do, you know, in your practice or that kind of stuff. Some because the kind of work they want to go into, they're going to go be veterinarians to birds or something. So there are special awards for that. So it's an interesting thing from my point of view to see the different kind of awards and the different. You know, oh, they're going to go into cats. Oh, okay, and or uh, horses, mm -hmm. and uh, and then it's always interesting to see who the person is, and what I have been doing for the past four or five years, even if I'm not here, it didn't matter, really matter. If I'm here, I'm happy. I meet them, but then I get their address, their email address, and I email them later, and and say if I haven't met them, then I say congratulations on, on an email and I say tell me a little bit about yourself. And so then they give me some more information about you know how they got into vet med and what they want to do. And so I, I get these stories about well I'm going to go work with my, my dad 
who does horse veterinarian uh, practice and that kind of stuff. So I really have enjoyed that. Now last, the, in years past, they've always sent me a letter about three weeks before telling me who's going to get it. Mm -hmm. They didn't do that last year, and I think part of that was because of the transition between the, the deans. Mm -hmm. uh, but I got, I got the letter this year, so I know who it is. And, uh, and well, so don't tell us. Oh, I'm not going to tell <laughs> you. So I kind of like that, uh, to know. And if I happen to meet them, you know, fine. Uh, but uh, it's really kind of cool, and then to, to take the picture afterward, and then of course it gets in the in the uh, Vet Cetera mm -hmm. magazine, which is always nice. And so I look forward to it from the standpoint I get a new uh, outfit, uh, and find find uh, orange, and finding orange down in Louisiana is just a little hard, <laughs> and a lot of times it's Tennessee orange. So I, I was looking for my uh, new outfit, and so I took my OSU hat into one of the places and I said, I need to match this hat. Okay. I need a new out okay. Can't be Tennessee orange. You know. And uh, so a lot of yellow and black. Yeah, so we found it. <laughs> you know, so that's always a challenge every year if I'm coming. <laughs> Stephen, is this your first banquet? It's my first banquet. I, I actually tried to make the journey last year again on my motorcycle and that time of year there was a lot of storms mm -hmm. rolling through and I had a window that I thought I was going to be able to capitalize on. However, I forgot about all the snow that all the storms dumped on the mountain passes. So He hit a dead end. I, he hit, I hit a road closed. A road closed <laughs> in Utah and I was very disappointed to have to turn back and drive back home. So I vowed to come out here this year um, and even if I had to fly but I really was wanted coming. to ride I yeah. was coming and um, the weather has been really kind of dry this year so all the roads were really nice had a great journey out here and I I'm compelled compelled to do it um, as a way to honor my family and and my ancestors. So. Well, as we, we wind down here, is there anything else you'd like to add uh, before we close on out? Any any final uh, remembrances of Dean McElroy? Well, I, I will tell you that I, I started doing some research, which interestingly I found that I was in the wrong part of the years. Uh, I wanted to do an article for the alumni magazine on the forgotten president. Or the lost president. I couldn't decide what the title, you know, working title, and do a little blurb on when Granddaddy w uh, actually functioned as an interim president of this university. Turned out it was back in '23. I thought it was much later, in during the uh, President Bennett's era, mm -hmm. uh, but I was wrong. So I thought, oh, I'm been looking in the wrong spot. So I still would like to write the article because. The interesting thing was I had gone to the uh, to Old Central one mm -hmm. day, and the lady who kind of stays over there and takes care of it, they have pictures up there of the presidents, and Granddaddy's pictures not up there, and and Granddaddy used to have a a room there, he lived there while he was in school, and uh, and for a room and board he uh, helped clean the building, and. Uh, and so uh, she was telling me that she was she didn't. It was unfortunate she couldn't add his picture because they don't see him as the as one of the presidents because it was an interim thing. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, you know, I still think that might be a nice little short article, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for either the paper or the or the magazine. So I, I'm still toying with that. Kind of thing to do a little blurb on there. I think so. I think that's a little bit of uh, OSU history we really don't think yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it wasn't very long and it was just for a purpose. And um, I think my concern was were there others? And so mm -hmm. I didn't really want to be exclusive to him uh, and not, not have some others. So that's why I haven't really gone any further uh, on that, uh, especially when I found out I was in the wrong year. Oops. <laughs> So hopefully that'll get done. Time to get yeah. to that. Yeah, hon.
Well, one, of, one of my retirement bucket lists. <laughs> yeah. Add it to the list. Yeah. Well, we really uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for sitting down with us and You're recording welcome. some of your memories of, of your family. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank you.